Welcome to the 45th episode of the Known Pleasures podcast. On this podcast, we discuss the post-punk and new wave movements of the late 70s and early 80s. In the description, you will find a link to a Spotify playlist made just for this episode, as well as a link to our Facebook, YouTube and Instagram pages and our Twitter handle. And now, I think it's my turn to introduce the subject of today's podcast. While Athens and Greece gifted civilization with democracy, science, philosophy, taxes, writing and schools, Athens and Georgia gave the world widespread panic, REM and the subject of today's podcast, the B-52s. A frenetic drummer in strange glasses, a guitarist who clearly needed to add more strings to his bow, a lead singer who would shout and vociferate more than sing, and two bouffant wearing female vocalists that sounded unlike anyone else. How was this a recipe for a successful new wave band? Today we will discuss this enigmatic band's journey from the mean streets of Athens to the top 40 charts of the land down under and ask the question, how did this happen? So settle back, relax and listen to this podcast for a future generation as we discuss the public persona and private Idaho of the B-52. Vociferate, you say, Graham. <laughs> I've been dying to get the word vociferate into a podcast for ages. It's only taken five years. <laughs> well done. How long have you been carrying that word around in your head? <laughs> I'm not even sure I pronounced it properly. No, no, it was good. It was good. I kind of it stumbled good. over it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, guys, the B-52s, where do we start? Well, Paddy, one I of your we patented start, intros. I want to start in New Jersey. Two of them are from New Jersey? Yeah, well, particularly like Fred. Fred Schneider, the singer, lead vocalist, born in uh, Newark, New Jersey. And he wound up in Athens, Georgia, where the band is from. And he said he decided to attend the university there. He was interested in wildlife conservation and chose Georgia because they supposedly had a good forestry school. So this is heading into a great rock and roll story already, isn't it? <laughs> he said, I figured it might be easier to get good grades there too because a lot of southern kids would come up to school in New Jersey and they'd always be a little bit behind. <laughs> so he felt like he'd be ahead of the game. So I figured maybe I wouldn't have to work so hard. <laughs> Who else uh, was from New Jersey out of uh, the Kate, five? Kate. Kate Pearson? So hang on, I've got, I've got several you, more paragraphs. Oh, about, you've got um, more? I'll, I'll, I'll go and come Fred's back, shall I? <laughs> <first. laughs> I'll go and get a coffee. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah, well, I'd, yeah um, uh, I don't know much about Athens, Georgia, but I do know a lot about Fred's academic career. Cool. Just to finish up, he said, but forestry was a little strange, which is a very Fred Schneider thing to say. <laughs> forestry was a little strange, so I switched to journalism, then dropped out. I stayed in Athens because I liked the town a lot. And Athens, Georgia, as a college town in what is perceived as a bit of a redneck state, then the group coalesced. Is that the word we're going to use? That's a good word. 1976. Mm. The story is a bit weird because it's, I don't know, they apparently all just got together after sharing some sort of cocktail and jammed afterwards and the band was formed. A very I, large cocktail. I find that hard to believe because they arrived so f completely and fully formed. It's hard not to think there was a lot of thought went into this. This isn't just five people jamming. Mm. Okay, so you think this was just part of the whole mythology? Yeah. Well, should we talk about the members? You've got Fred Schneider, Kate Pearson, uh, vocals, keyboard, Cindy Wilson and Ricky Wilson, who were brother and sister, Keith Strickland on drums. They didn't play their first gig until um, uh, Valentine's Day in 1977. But what I was struck by was, when going back and listening mm. to the music, was, yeah, how complete it was. It was a concept, you know, the style, everything about it, the lyrical content, everything was really, mm, really mm. organised and thought out, and far more so than most other bands that just kind of like, yeah, we got together and started jamming. I mean, it's just completely mm. unique and, and fully formed. And mm, but I, I was wondering, was it that well thought out? Because to me, it seems like a, a bunch of people who were just pushed into a room and started mm. playing whatever instruments were in front of them. Mm. That's, in, that's impressive. And I think... I think what you're saying is true, but weirdly, the exact opposite also seems true. Like, the whole thing was just spontaneous. It's such an individual sound. Like, even the guitar, you know, that, uh, that Ricky Wilson's doing, it, it's not mm. just an accident. Mm. I mean, it's meant to look like that. That's what I think. And the op shop look and the 60s sci-fi thing, the whole... Mm. That's probably their parents' music that they were kind of <laughs> replicating, I suppose, that they grew yeah. up with. I can picture it as this haphazard bringing together of elements because there aren't actually that many elements because the sound is really quite open and quite sparse. Mm. So there aren't that many people actually playing instruments. But did they sound like anybody else you'd ever heard of? Like I, I remember hearing Rock Lobster and I bought 
Planet Claire when it came out, and I'd never heard anything like it. Yeah, I couldn't yeah, reference yeah. anything. I was talking to a friend of mine the other night about the harmonies that the girls did. There's no reference point for those that I can either hear. He was yeah, sort of saying yeah. the Beach Boys, but they're really quite yeah, strange, yeah, yeah, you know, the, unusual, the way yeah. that they sing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, But they seem like classic... Art school students. Yeah, maybe that's mm. it. And how big is Athens or how big was Athens at that time? It's a university town, but how mm. many people? 60,000 people or something, I think. So it's so sort of like the size of a regional town. So I suppose everybody knows everybody. Yeah. And there's a little party scene. That seems to be a thing mm. that they talk about. Everybody went to each other's parties and would play music. and. Because it's interesting that we've spoken about Devo before. Yeah, I was going to say that reminded me of the. Yeah, we'll and, get to them. <laughs> and, and when it comes to very visual theatrical bands, like mm. in this country, Split Ends, yeah, they weren't part of any kind of movement. They, they mm. just wanted to be different to everyone else. And then New Wave came along. And I read this quote recently about the B-52s. They said, when the New Wave scene arrived at their doorstep, they were dressed and ready to go, mm. which I thought was because they were, mm. were dressed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Probably more dressed than ready to go. But um, I see a parallel with Split Ends here and Devo as well. Yeah. They didn't really care about movements. Mm. Mm. No, no, but it suited them. The time suited mm. them. I mean, when yeah. you were talking about the bands that came out of Athens, you should have also mentioned Pylon. I'd never heard of widespread panic, I have to confess mm. my ignorance. REM, obviously, I know, but Pylon were, um, were a big influence. Oh, it really? came out of the sort of... A lot of talk about Gang of Four's influence on this town, for me, I can hear that in the guitar playing of Ricky Wilson. You're going to talk about the tunings on his guitar. I am. Brand, I'm because not he only had you know, four strings, but I love his guitar, but it's it's quite strange and I don't know how you work that out. So I'm what did not, you come I'm not up only with? going to tell you about it, I'm going to play you something. Oh, my God. Well, don't go that far. <laughs> <laughs> well, I brought my Farfisa in. <laughs> <laughs> I bought my Buffon wig, which I rarely leave home without. So uh, we're in for a fun in night. Fact, you're wearing it now. I'm wearing it now. <laughs> it's a pity we're not videoing this <laughs> yeah. podcast. Um, yeah, I did want to talk about uh, Ricky's guitar playing. He played a Mosrite Ventures 11 blue guitar. He used particularly heavy gauge strings and a heavy pick, which which was um, all a part of the sound. But his guitar tuning, and this, by the way, was only on Dance This Mess Around and Rock Lobster. He tuned his guitar. Well, actually, he removed the two middle strings, so the D and the G string were gone. Let me play it for you. Yeah. Is something you prepared earlier? or This is a shitty old guitar. This may be our first ever unedited um, podcast. Yes. <laughs> this is going so smoothly, don't you think? I can edit out that, uh, <laughs> that little gap. Okay, so as you can see, guys, and the, our listeners can't see... Have you taken two strings I've off? I've taken two strings off this guitar. This is an old guitar because I didn't want to ruin my yeah, anyway, yeah. actual guitars. But what he did was the E and the A, he tuned them down to C and F. Mm. So, which is quite low, as you yeah. can hear. It gives it a very bassy sound yeah. for, the, for the uninitiated out there. But the weird thing, and I, I don't know whether this is still in tune, the uh, B and E strings he tuned up to F, so they were the same note, but it's octave apart. Right. <laughs> How would you arrive at that? That's the other thing I don't understand. I don't know. This is what I'm going to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically when it came to Rock Lobster, he just played those... And um, he also did things like a... And that little da da is the most bizarre sound I've ever heard. But it was him playing those two F notes. Yeah, yeah. It was a little bit out of tune, by the way. But um, So basically, if you strummed his guitar tuned like this, you would only hear two notes, C and F. Ah. But just three so different... Can, can you, can you give us a chord there, Graham? Yeah. It's a little bit it's out of tune. It's a little bit out of tune. Yeah. The great thing about this, and I think this has a lot to do with, uh, or it says a lot about their actual sound, is that his chord shapes were really different. Like even when he does that. <laughs> there, was, there was no chance of them becoming like a strummy REM style guitar band. There was, yeah, yeah. It's like they only use the notes that they needed. I will turn this off now. I also yeah. think that he was influenced by Andy Gill. I know that, that those early Gang of Four singles 
And oh, in yeah. entertainment, the album was apparently a big feature on the uh, Athens party scenes, according to Michael Stipe anyway. Yeah. Um, I, I can hear not the harmonics and stuff that Andy Gill would do or the feedback, but this kind of rhythm stuff and that kind of choppy sound. Mm. To me, I can hear it anyway. The, the detuning notwithstanding, but, you yeah. know, the sound of what he was doing there. But at the time, I thought that all of his songs were with this four strings, but it's not. There's a, a song called Lava, which is in drop D and with five strings, and I know this because there are people online who uh, show you how to play the songs. Oh, okay. This is what they've done. And 52 Girls and 606842 is just the normal six strings standard tuning. Yep. So if you sat down... Put the album on and, and tried to, to play along. With to, it. You couldn't play along with the whole album unless you'd have to remove strings and then yeah, put yeah, them back yeah. on and then constantly. Remove. Maybe so, you have two guitars. Yeah. yeah well, so they did record that. an album. Are we? Well, cause, can cause, we just talk about the fact that Rock Lobster was did the they ever first record single? an album? We haven't got that anywhere near that far in the story. We haven't. <laughs> oh, no, no. Sorry, I, I did want to talk about his guitar <laughs> before we got to the album. Yes, mm. yes. But uh, I think we're what there. About on there. <laughs> Well, <laughs> on, yeah. on the song Rome, what what, what were the guitar tunings? <laughs> I'll get on the Love Shack <laughs> in the in the next part. You're uh, ruining my chronology here. Yeah. I'm very I'm very attached to chronological order. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> well, was there more you wanted to say about them before the album? Uh, they recorded Rock Lobster in April '78. Their first single. There are a couple of phases in the career of Rock Lobster. Mm-hmm. Never mind the B-52s, because mm-hmm. they recorded it in April '78, and it took a long time to kind of get anywhere. And you know, it became very big in one particular country, which we'll get to mm-hmm. when we reach that point in the chronological order, Graham. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> But, yeah, the original recording, they had a deal with DB Records. We were at a party. Hey, dear love fell in the deep. Well, I was going to say that was off the back of them playing in New York. They mm, would drive mm. to New York and play these gigs at CBGB's and, and Max's Kansas City. And mm. apparently, uh, as soon as they were seen by those kind of ultra-cool crowds there, the next week, Debbie Harry was there, Patti Smith was there, Gene Simmons was there. <laughs> All of these people turn up after one gig to see these guys yeah, and they yeah, were an yeah, instant yeah. hit. But yeah. when you see them, it's a no-brainer. You know the crowd that would go and see them. But this yeah. is what I'm saying about them being fully formed. I just find it hard to believe that they could just turn up like that and that never happens. It's mm. always like we played for a few years and no one was interested. This was like the first time we played anywhere, everybody loved us. I don't know. I mean, um, Orchestral Manoeuvres in the Dark had a record deal after eight months, I think. Well, I guess it happens. It does happen. It obviously yeah. happened. But <laughs> they started fully formed, just the three members of Iron Day. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to do an OMD podcast now? Oh, that's right. We've already done one. <laughs> <laughs> Just Paul, Andy and Winston. Winston Admittedly, yeah. Winston was a tape recorder, but I'm pretty wedded to the idea of them being a trio. <laughs> but, uh, yes, so the f- debut album came out in July 1979 after they'd been signed by... Island Records. Mm. Now, this is the thing we should talk about. What band gets to go to the Bahamas for their first album? Mm. And get produced by Chris Blackwell. Yes. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That isn't that's what that's where I can't get my head. That's around. what I'm saying. It was just such a meteoric kind mm. of journey for them, you know. Remembering they did their first gig in '77, so this is all happening very, very fast mm. from yes. a little town to this kind of thing. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. this album, I mean, we'll talk about it in detail, but well, I, we can talk about it right we now. We can talk think, about it right I think now. We're there. I think we're there. Going yes. back, I'm to, feeling comfortable to, with where we are now. Yeah, happy, Patrick. <laughs> all right. Going back and listening to it, I have not listened to this album in in a long, long time, and I just absolutely loved it. And Mm. it just took me back to being, I don't know, 15 again. Mm. And I talk about this a lot, but it was one of those albums, and I don't know whether you guys found this, that friends of mine that didn't like punk and didn't like New Wave, Mm. girls in particular, Mm. loved the B-52s. I remember Mm. going over to a young lady's house in maybe year 10, and she had this album and she put it on and we danced and jived around. Was that when her father came out and said, you stay away from my daughter? Something <laughs> along those lines. But it was one of those sort of albums that everybody loved. I mean, mm-hmm. You know, you've got so many fantastic songs like the, on it. Like the whole album, not just Yeah, the, the whole album. They, yeah. You know, she loved the album. As I said, I found it hard to get a lot of my other friends interested in the music I was interested in in, in 79 and 80, but this yeah, was an yeah, immediate yeah. hit. You know, you've got your, your singles on there, your Rock Lobsters, your Planet Claire's Dance This Mess Around. I actually bought Planet Claire because of that Peter Gunn guitar riff, mm, yep. which I love. And even the start of it with that weird kind of space age little mm, bleeping mm, noises. It was yeah, it's just like it's a, a Morse code thing. Yeah, like a Morse code, like from outer space. But um, I, I just want to say that the, the whole album is just... 
There's no songs about relationships. There's mm. no. There's nothing no. in there that you can refer to yeah. that you go, oh, it's like this or yeah. it's like that. They love planets. Yes, yeah, yeah. planets and no, love. There's an implication <laughs> of a relationship with um, the woman from Planet Claire. Possibly. I think. Yeah. Possibly. But I do have a couple of questions about... About, <laughs> about actual Claire? <laughs> yeah. Well, if she didn't have a head... <laughs> well, no one had a head there. How was she driving a Plymouth satellite? She drove a Plymouth satellite. <laughs> I, think, I think at the DMV, having a head is like a prerequisite. <laughs> the authorities Surely. in Athens, Georgia, did they not notice? <laughs> <laughs> well, it was on Planet Claire. She came from Planet Claire. Can we go back to Rock Lobster, by the way, because it's seven minutes long, mm. right? I know. Yeah, and it's yeah, got yeah. about 13 bits to it. Mm, it it's and like Bohemian yeah, Rhapsody. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's it's got the Yoko Ono thing going on in it. <laughs> All kinds of things happening, and it was, as we alluded to before, it was a massive hit, certainly in Australia. I don't think we can overestimate, or it's hard to overestimate, how massive the song Rock Lobster was in Australia. In Australia. And yeah. I mean, they they say themselves, Cindy said something like, you know, 78, 79 or whatever, we were, we were getting a bit used to the idea of being a college band and, you know, appealing to those university type audiences, college radio and, mm. and so on. And then everything exploded in Australia. Mm. And a bit went, like hot lava. Mm, well, yeah, yeah, that's right. <laughs> and their appearance on the Australian Music Show Countdown, mm. which was a show that everyone watched, was feels to me like a seismic moment in Australian sort of popular culture almost because that clip to me, like I can remember it like it was yesterday seeing that clip on mm. Countdown Sunday 6pm and it was a really elaborate kind of well choreographed film clip. There were bubbles. I mean, there was trouble, obviously, but there were <laughs> there were bubbles floating around, and uh, like you know, they seemed to have a couple of cameras focusing on the right person at the right time, which is quite hard to do because it was a theatrical production. Mm, <laughs> so was, over yeah. the course of the five minutes or so, and I like the fact that the official clip for this song, the official B fifty two clip, which I think is like a live clip, but mm. has eleven million views, and the countdown clip, which is on YouTube as well also has 11 million views, wow. just from the Australian TV appearance. I think it got to, what, number seven? Three. No, number three yeah, in Australia. The album got, the to, album got seven. to seven, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. So it once three. again, we, it was a bit like Blondie. We were one of the first to take to mm. the mm. Australians' work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Graham, what was your what was your take on this album? Well, I liked the Peter Gunn guitar in Planet Claire too. Mm. Kate is playing a synth melody, which is quite simply her going down the keyboard, semitone by semitone. Yeah. <laughs> it's very, very simple, but really effective. I guess that, that was the kind of space age sound of the song. And also, it takes two and a half minutes before the singing starts, mm. which is uh, kind of unusual for the time. Yeah, so you're going yeah. with the new wave Bohemian Rhapsody. Yes, the I love new, that analogy, the new wave Bohemian Rhapsody. Mm, absolutely. That's, that's not absolutely. bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> 52 Girls, I think, is a great song. The uh, B-52s love a list mm. in Dance This Mess Around. Which is a fantastic song. It's yeah, it's a great song, yeah. yeah. It's very intense. Mm. Very intense. What is a Limburger? This is a cheese. cheese. Is it? Thank you. Right, there we go. But she says, I'm not no Limburger, which yes. is a double negative. So she is a Limburger. She is a Limburger. Yeah. Yeah. I believe it was the slang style. Slang at the, the time. It was a double negative meaning. Atlanta, a Atlanta negative. Georgia thing. Oh, or okay. Athens, yeah. Georgia, sorry. <laughs> it was a regional thing, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, regional thing. Yeah, in Dances Mess Around, he says they do all 16 dances, and then he starts to list the dances. <laughs> Rock Lobster, there's a list of fish. Here comes a stingray. There goes a man ray. In walked a jellyfish. 52 Girls was a list of girls. And in uh, There's a Moon in the Sky called the Moon, they list planets. Rain us. Rain us. Lyrically, they were also really out there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, with Rock Lobster, was there ever a more iconic song that featured a cowbell? I could have used a little more cowbell. <laughs> well, think? that's open to discussion. <laughs> 
And yeah, I also spoke about the arrangement of, of Rock Lobster because um, the drums and guitars, they're kind of doing a similar thing all the way through. Mm. But it is the arrangement of the vocals, like the girls are going skadoobada at the beginning. Skadoobada. But later on they do this ooh-ah bit. Ooh-ah. And of course there's the bit where they're making all the fish noises. That's the Yoko Ono bit. There goes a dogfish. Chased by a catfish. <laughs> Well, that's interesting. Should we do a, a bit of a just an aside here and talk about how John Lennon said that Rock Lobster inspired him to make music again? Yeah, well, apparently he heard it at a club somewhere. Um, he was out at a club and heard the song and, and decided that you know music was going to be good again and he'd better get mm. back into it. Better get the old axe out. And wake up the missus. <laughs> wake up the missus. <laughs> Which could be misconstrued. <laughs> yeah. but, but the thing is, like, that's all great and everything, but... If you ever heard the John Lennon album that he produced, it yeah. was nothing double like... Fantasy. Yeah, yeah, double yeah, Fantasy. Yeah, Double Fantasy. It was nothing like... Yeah, it was weird that listening to that album led Lennon to such a cosy, domesticated yes. kind of album, which got pretty bad reviews when it initially came out. Like, it was released about three weeks before he died. Mm. And there was one review of Double Fantasy by Charles Shah Murray oh, in, yeah. in, in NME. He, he said that he wished Lennon had kept his big, happy trap shut <laughs> until... This is three weeks before he dies, by the way. <laughs> Um, he wished Lennon had kept his big, happy trap shut until he has something to say that was even vaguely relevant to those of us not married to Yoko Ono. <laughs> and, you know, Gosh. I mean, Lennon's death was absolutely tragic, but the album Double Fantasy, I have to say, it was was not my favourite. It was very safe and, you know, the, the songs were mm. overly sentimental and everything. But he just thought when he said that, mm. I thought he was going to get Yoko to do the, the weird stuff that they used to do in the plastic mm. Maybe he did that and then they recorded the album. <laughs> well, he did specifically say that um, uh, if I might stay on track, that <laughs> <laughs> someone has to. <laughs> that uh, Rock Lobster reminded him of Yoko's song "Why," and it does sound quite similar. At least the intro to Yoko's "Why." Okay. So yeah. I'm going to just throw in a bit of the sounds here, in case anyone doesn't know it. The 50s and 60s influences, the pop sounds, the surf kind of sounds, mm, yeah. the new wave sounds, white funk. It was a bit of everything in there. Mm. But I did want to go back to myself and the young lady at uh, after school when Hot Lava came on. That's when things got a little heated because that's a pretty risque song. <laughs> Is it? Look it- at the lyrics, Graham. I mean, it'll, it'll send you off. Risque is the the song Cake from a few albums later. Possibly, I'm not oh, familiar we'll, with We'll cake. discuss that later on. <laughs> yeah, listeners, don't, go, go, don't, and, go and have a listen. I, don't I, make me angry, Graham. I know that talking about sex gets uh, Patrick a little bit... Uh, no, no, getting one album ahead of schedule makes oh, me really yeah. angry. <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> That's worse. <laughs> Talk Even about worse. whatever you like as long as we're doing it in sequence. <laughs> Well, oh. if we're doing this in sequence, I saw the B-52s in Brisbane. Mark, did you see that? I didn't, and I don't know why. You said they played a massive amount of gigs in uh, Sydney. In Sydney, yeah. They played a lot in Sydney. They yeah. played four in Sydney. But remember how Gary Newman played in Brisbane? And then the Boomtown Rats played a week later? A week later, I do remember. You, you yes. went to those, I went didn't to you? both. Well, the B-52s were only about three weeks after that. Maybe that's why I couldn't afford it to go. <laughs> yes. At that age that I was, whatever, 14 or 15, I but, couldn't afford that. But the uh, Brisbane gig seems to have been, um, I, I can't find the date. It's, it's almost like it never happened. But you mm. went. But I definitely went. I, def- I was definitely. I don't know who I went with. Did you enjoy yourself? Do you remember but, that much? Yeah, mm. the, I remember the audience loved it, and they were great. Reproducing the sound of the album, they were absolutely incredible. Obviously, there's not much there to reproduce, but no. uh, yeah, the singing and everything was just spot on. Chris Blackwell, with his production, was absolutely trying to make it sound as raw and as unoverdubbed and as unaffected as possible, which yes. the band hated. They hated it, didn't they? <laughs> yeah, they didn't like it. They and thought so, it yeah, sounded rinky was, dink. Yeah, rinky dink, yeah. But yeah. he's been proven correct. <laughs> mm. But it wasn't a massive hit in America, 59. Um, yeah. Australia, obviously, is a much smaller yeah. market. And UK number 22. Oh, that, well, that's a little bit better. Unbelievably groundbreaking first album and mm. still sounds amazing to mm. this day. And as somebody else pointed out, if you put on half the tracks on this album at any party anywhere in the world at any time, you'll get the floor full yep. straight away because mm. they still work, particularly Rock Lobster, yep. of course, absolute classic. Is uh, it time to move on, Patrick, or have you well, got some more? Uh, well, I was going to say that the <laughs> Lava, yes, the controversial Lava yes, song, yes. does remind me quite a bit of 
the guitar work and so on of uh, REM. And those kind of like indie sort of bands that came in the B-52's wake. Mm. Hero Worship is a little bit similar as well, so you can see in some ways the starting points of bands like R.E.M. And Michael Stipe was a massive fan of the band. I think he was kind of friends. Friend, yeah, they were friends. friends they the all band. knew each other in that yeah. small um, and world. And his family, I think, had moved to Athens and he was an army brat himself and he'd lived in lots of places. But he ended up in Athens because he ran out of money this is when he was 18, in 1978, and he said that like Athens was a town full of hippies and granola, I think might have been the term he used. <laughs> <laughs> well, that would have suited R.E.M. Uh, well, he was a punk at the time, but he said he kind of felt saved by the kind of eccentricities and genuinely punk attitude of the B-52s that they were just doing whatever the hell they wanted to do. Mm. Yeah. which was the real punk thing as distinct from the, you know, having the right kind of spiky hair or whatever, which was how things were going in New York, mm. for mm-hmm. instance, in the, the less Athens-ish parts of the states <laughs> as far as the counterculture went. Speaking of punk, in January 1980, the B-52s played their first uh, performance on Saturday Night Live. Mm-hmm. We talk about this a lot because it's it's sort of a gateway for people to seek a bigger audience. They've played Rock, Lobster and Dance this mess around. If you get a chance to see those uh, performances, it's fantastic. Now, a young Kurt Cobain apparently was watching and he was uh, very much inspired by what he saw on this particular evening that there was stuff like this happening in America great stuff if you get a chance to look at it um are we moving on to the well, second can I just album? Say about 60608 for the tour? <laughs> I'll try three times. I'll eventually get there. I don't think we've asked uh, Patrick what, he, what his favourite no, song is. I think we I'm, did. I'm pretty sure like he's been I talking like a I've lot. Said, I feel like I've said virtually nothing this entire podcast. <laughs> really? I find that hard to believe. <laughs> Once you finish editing out my monologues, it probably will be me saying nothing. But uh, yeah, 60608 follows the time on a tradition of songs containing phone numbers. 606! And you know where I'm going with this. Orchestral yeah. Maneuvers in the Dark. ACDC. Blondie, hanging on the telephone. It's no number, <laughs> but still. <laughs> Song about and Tommy Two Tone. Tommy Two Tone, yeah. yeah. If you get a chance to look at the Wikipedia page 48675309, it's worth saying the, the long, speaking of list, the very long list of organisations that have profited and failed to profit from the phone number 8675309 in the decades since. Some have done very well, some have been driven out of their minds. Out of their minds, absolutely. <laughs> I can't imagine how anyone would uh, profit from it. But, uh, uh, well, if you're a pizza delivery service. And if your name was Jenny. Jenny, Jenny. Album two. Album two, Wild Album Planet. Two. Wild Planet. 27th of August, 1980. Mostly considered by fans to be their best album. Is that the general consensus you guys came up with? I got more of a first album Did kind you? of vibe. I, I wasn't as familiar with Wild Planet, mm. but I do like it. And the most interesting thing I found about it was that Rhett Davies was the producer. You might say, why is that? Well, Rhett Davies had just been working on Flesh and Blood for Roxy Music, was going to work on Avalon for Roxy Music, and had been working with Brian Eno. So not exactly um, looking no, to work no. with a 50s, 60s uh, party band from Athens, Georgia, but I think he did a great job. The interesting thing about this album was that it, it contains songs that they had been playing for a long time, mm. and they saved them. Like, normally bands would have put their best foot forward on their first album, mm. but the fact that they held back a song like Private Idaho, which I think is genius, mm. in retrospect, it's a clever thing to do because um, yeah, yeah. this album had great songs on it as well. The three singles are absolutely stonkers, all three. Mm. Uh, Give Me Back My Man and Party Out of Bounds. Big success. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, again, Australia, loving it. Number 12? Yeah, yeah, we're top 20 in the US, UK and, and Australia. And the UK, yeah, yeah. And Private Idaho have got to number 11 in Australia, and apparently they didn't play, B-52s didn't play their first ever gig in Idaho until 2011. Really? Probably is, because of that. Which is, yeah, I mean, no, they weren't welcome. No, I'm not sure what, 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 the, <laughs> what the background was, but, yes, I mean, it's a fair distance. It's about 2,000 miles or so from Georgia to Idaho. Go it 
it's a slicker album, I think. Mm, yeah. um, the bass, the keyboard bass is a little more prominent. It was a bit fuller sounding. Mm. Had the um, the slightly controversial Dirty Back Road, which is the uh, hot lava of this album. <laughs> I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I... <laughs> Yeah, they, they, they'd like to sneak these yeah, into the album. That song is just about rural back roads. That's, that's, okay then, Graham. Yeah, that's well, I don't know what you were doing in uh, 1980, but it was obviously different to what I was doing. <laughs> Once you get beyond the outskirts of Athens, it's nothing but back roads. <laughs> All bets are off. <laughs> I really like this album. As I said, I wasn't as super familiar with it, so I don't know why. Maybe I've moved on a little bit, but um, yeah, I think it's fantastic. Private Idaho, as you said, Graham, fantastic. Mm. How, how did you find this album? Were you still on board the B-52s bandwagon? No, I wasn't, wagon? I wasn't either. I, like, I, I listened to the first album a lot, and I really liked Private Idaho when it was released, but I didn't know a lot of these songs. Party Out of Bounds, I didn't know. I knew Give Me Back My Man, which is a great song. <laughs> So like strobe light in Keith Lorraine. Mm. Keith Lorraine is an old song, apparently. Is it? One That's of the first songs song. they ever... Oh, it's one of their songs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. My little friend, Keith. Keith Who writes a song about Keith Lorraine? It's about the dog. Yeah, Keith it's Lorraine, about yeah. a dog and its adventures with other dogs. Yeah. I'm not sure I fully understood the song. <laughs> Well, that's Fred for you. Mm. I like the song, the discordant guitar mm. on uh, Keith Rain. There's a bit of discordant guitar mm. on this album more so than the first Andy album. It's a bit of Andy Gill guitar again mm. to me. Yeah, yeah slightly more post-punk in the post punk sort of very much so, sense, yeah. 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 And less sort of um, Dick Dale. Surf guitar reference there, listeners? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a surf guitar reference. Anyway, successful album. They were happy with it. Record company was happy with it. Are we done with it? Well, I might move on from 52 Girls to 53 Miles. Okay. West of Venus. <laughs> um, Is that where the I, dirty back road I've got the album. If I've got the album right. <laughs> yeah, that's my favourite song on uh, Wild Planet. Okay. The uh, Again, a bit of discordant guitar. So, yeah, I think it's great. Yeah, I didn't have much else to say about this album because, as I said, I didn't really listen to it much mm. at the time. And I, I do like it, but um, I don't think I really listened to the B-52s much after the first it album. It didn't resonate to, to, with you. To tell the truth. Mm. You'd seen them live. It was time to move on. It was time to move on. I was you, listening you, to other stuff. You hadn't started a band trying to replicate the B-52s. <laughs> it seems to happen a lot with you. <laughs> <laughs> I stopped singing and I just started talking my lyrics. <laughs> and I had two bouffant wearing women singing backup vocals. You were dressing like you were ready to get on a, a yacht at Cape Cod with JFK. <laughs> That's right, yes. That, that lasted all of a month. <laughs> <laughs> and I removed two strings from my guitar. Shall we move on to Mesopotamia? Yeah, this is a funny one, isn't it? Because it was released initially as a six-track EP and then re-released as a six-tracks remix from the previous yeah, albums. Is that yeah. right? I mean, I'm a little confused because yeah. when I went to look for it, it came up with a couple of different yeah. formats. The band did a long interview with Rolling Stone after they recorded the second album and they were saying that they were feeling a bit trapped by maybe the image of them as a party band and all that sort of stuff. So they wanted to do something different. Mm. So that's why they got David Byrne into Yeah, they got David, mm. David Byrne. Who they were friends with, obviously, yeah, part yeah. of the uh, New York And, scene. yeah, I think they were all living in a house together. That's right. That's weird, isn't it? At the it? time. And that's Why that's would you do that work. as a band after touring and recording mm. for a few years together? Didn't work for the young ones. No. It's not going to work gonna for the It's not going to work for the You only do that if you really have to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The sessions were not that happy. Fraught. I felt that David Byrne was maybe trying to make them sound a bit too much like Talking Heads and Brian Eno. Like well, he was also doing the Catherine Wheel um, yeah, stuff the at the time. So Wheel apparently album he was for the for the dance. Yeah, project. so he was recording all day and then all night. So there was this like twenty four hour sessions. Yeah, that yeah, he doing was doing the nights, spreading the, himself a little B-52s. too thin. Yeah, yeah. So I don't think it was a happy time for them, and I think they more or less didn't know what to do once they'd finished the sessions mm. because they didn't think there was an album worth of material there. So I don't they, think there is either when I no, listen to it. But yeah. but they ended up cobbling together an EP. And there was a mix-up so that the wrong version was released in the UK. So there's an eight-minute version of Love Land. Love Land, yeah. On the UK version. Love Land. 
and it was not meant to be released. And like the version that was supposed to be was the one on the US version. That's probably one of the best tracks on there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a funny one because none of the songs sound completed. They sound like demos. Like, it's just not that catchy. Kate said afterwards, we sometimes think, wow, if only we could go back and finish Mesopotamia. Mm-hmm. So, so that's, that, that's exactly I mean, right. the song Mesopotamia and Deep Sleep were both released as singles, I think. But um, mm. And it was a relative hit. January 82 is it top 40 in the US, top 20 in the UK. Yep. yep. But I, listening to it, I just don't really hear songs. I just hear kind of ideas um, yeah, that yeah. aren't realised. For me, it's quite odd in that you are ten minutes into the EP before you hear Fred's voice. Mm. <laughs> mm. So it just has this weird kind of experimental. I don't want to say half baked, but but yeah, not not quite done. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean by demos. To me, that's how it mm. sounded like. There's there's no there's the catchy element, the choruses and stuff just aren't there. Did you hear this, Graham? Well, I'm going to uh, disagree with you guys on this. What? I do like it, by the way. I, I, yeah, I do like the EP, <laughs> but it does feel a bit unfinished at times. On repeated it? listenings, when I first listened to it, I thought, oh, yeah. But on repeated listenings, I actually love the EP now. I reckon the songs are real growers. Admittedly, it was on my fifth listen that I started to really enjoy it. You don't usually uh, give anything that much of a chance, Graham. I'm impressed. <laughs> no. like three listens and you're like, eh. <laughs> I've had an enormous amount of time on my hands. <laughs> I reckon they may be losing some of their unique B-52-ness in it. Like mm. Deep Sleep is the most un-B-52 song I've heard or that they've ever done, but I really like it. That's the David Byrne influence, I think. Yeah, I think it was, yeah. There was a bit of David Byrne there. David Byrne also brought in, interestingly, other musicians Session music, for this album. Yeah. And one of them was former Saturday Night Live cast member Charles Rocket, who was the, at the time, I think he was the Weekend Update guy. And he played accordions. <laughs> I don't know why he chose him to come in and play accordion. Mm. My favourite song on the album is Cake. You I don't, also, your you don't feel food. like it's undercooked. <laughs> I, I, I don't want to make... That was um, the only pun I was going to do in this episode and, and I got nothing. I will put in a smattering of applause. Laugh after, track. After All said. crickets. <laughs> <laughs> My favourite song on the album is Cake. You don't feel like it's undercooked. I don't want to make Patrick uncomfortable here, but... Um, You're not going to do a, a chronology <laughs> shift, are you? No, no, I'm still talking about Cake. It goes, I am watching it drip down the sides. If you want a better batter, better beat it harder. <laughs> I am watching it drip down the sides. I mean, it goes on. I, the down. last line is, I can't wait to put the icing on the cake. I'm assuming this is just about making a cake. Or several cakes. Take a little. 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 But I'd say this is the uh, dirty back road of this. There's exactly. always a sneaky song in there, isn't there? <laughs> yeah. yeah. But also, Mesopotamia's chorus, I ain't no student of ancient culture. Before I talk, I should read a book. But there's one thing I do know, there's lots of ruins in Mesopotamia. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why, but that makes me laugh. I am no student of ancient culture. But once again... They're not writing about relationships no. or mm, love. Not right? in anyway. the traditional sense, no. no. Um, apparently there were three tracks that weren't used that were left over and then put on the subsequent album, which are actually quite good tracks. So this EP may have benefited from those three tracks. Mm-hmm. But wasn't there some dispute with the manager at this point about... Um, well, this is, what, this is what Fred says anyway, that the manager didn't want them to be sort of um, played on urban radio, which was code for black radio in those days. So he was sort of steering them away from being too dancey. And mm. then he feels like Talking Heads went down that road and ended up having great success with, uh, yeah, with yeah. doing that sort of sound. Mm. That I don't know. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I could see them crossing over and would have easily crossed over with, with what they were doing then. Shall we head to Whammy? Whammy being the last album that we'll be talking yes, about. 27th yes, 27th of April, 83. So we've pretty quickly moved through these, haven't we? There's an album every year, more or less, 79, mm. 80, oh, yeah, 82 and 83. I would like to say that I just found this sound very like Devo. Um, all the instruments mm. were played by Ricky and Keith on this album. Yeah, they, they took over. On took the over. Same. So it was all drum machine, very synthy, synth bass. You know, um, I don't mind it. The three, the three singles are quite good. Legal tender. I actually really like "Song for a Future Generation." Let's 
song for a future generation is, you don't find it slightly just a little bit annoying? A um, bit too bubbly? A bit too bubbly, no. I'm pretty much a happy kind of guy. I like that sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. It kind of made me think of Shiny Happy People, the later collaboration. Kate Sang, yeah. With R.E.M. and Kate, and that was widely derided. Shiny. Song for a Future Generation is of that ilk, I think. Butter beans? Yeah, I was going to say, did you want to talk about butter beans? Ask me a place, oh, I'll be great. Oh, one, two, three, four. I don't know whether butter beans is, well, I wrote down irresistible or irredeemable. And <laughs> Could I, it be both? Yeah, I think it is kind of both. It is hilarious, but it's also, oh, is he still going on about butter beans? We're two and a half minutes in. <laughs> Uh, is is butter beans an analogy? Well, I'm sure. I'm sure you've, you've got a theory on the lyrics there. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I think their lyrics were nothing but respectable after cake. Hmm. Did you listen to this album, Graham? Then yes, I did. What were you listening to around this time that the B52 sat in with? You can cast your mind back to April mm. '83. April '83. Bit of echo on the bunny. I man? Just turned. No, I was about to turn 21. Um, you were cleaning the swimming pool that you were attending to. No, no. I, I was, Lumber yard. Uh, no, no, I was selling liquor at that point. <laughs> <laughs> Sling, slinging rocks on the corner. <laughs> <laughs> this was the drug dealing phase I had a of your still. life. <laughs> <laughs> Playing in the jug band on the side. <laughs> the jug band years. We've never talked about that. No, no one talks about the jug band years. <laughs> Oh, the prohibition years. We don't talk enough about about that era of your life. We talk about your years as a swimming pool attendant working in a, a lumber yard. Yeah. You've been everywhere, man. I have been everywhere. But look at me now. Mm. <laughs> yes. I get to press record for a living. <laughs> well, you just got to play some guitar before. Detuned. Mm, yeah, yeah. No yes. In answer to your question, I can't think of what I was listening to back then. What Simple Minds album came out in 83? Uh, Spark on the Rain. Spark on the Rain? I thought that was 84, but... I was, I was listening to New Gold Dream, maybe. I think that came out at the end of 82, did it? Hmm. Yeah, this is April 83, so I could have still been... Mm. <laughs> that porcupine. I tell you what, I'll go back and look at my record collection mm. and I'll edit in what I was listening to. I was to just the try, trying to get a framework of mm. what else was mm. going on that may have caught your attention. Mm. Jonah Louie, Stop the Cavalry. Stop the Cavalry was... That, was, 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 that, that, that might have been that time. Time. I do love a bit of Jonah Louie. Um, I like Legal Tender... I didn't mind Song for a Future Generation, um, Butter Beans, Trism, which is apparently about time travel, and Big Bird. Mm. I like Big Bird as well. Mm. Trism could be a Devo song. Yes. In one of the most Devo-ish. This was probably the end of the road for them in a lot of ways, this album, wasn't it? I mean, we are going to finish on this album, but... <laughs> end of the road? Well... In that, I think you'll finally um, saw a sign at the end of that road that said 15 miles to the luxury. Well, I'm aware, I'm aware that Ricky Wilson dies after this. Oh, album. yes, yes. So, the end of the road, given that the original lineup changed and that they went through a bit of a difficult period mm-hmm. after this. Um, of course, to come back bigger and better, which, which we don't go into with some great songs, but um, it was a funny journey mm. up to this point. And this album is a little bit disappointing for me, ah. anyway. I, I okay. don't. I don't love it. Uh, and, yeah, I think it has lost a bit of the soul and a bit of the heart of the sound. So a couple of the members felt the same way, apparently. Mm. But um, they, well, I think they were trying to kind of modernise, as, as you said earlier, kind of move on from where they felt trapped. Mm. But it's kind mm. of you've got something and then you lose it by kind of changing it too much. And this mm. could have been a Devo album, yeah. And as you always point out, Patrick, it's it's got a dated sound because of that a little bit more than... So the others. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I thought, I thought that as well. Obviously, they bought DX7s and Lindrums and things, mm. and all those familiar sounds came through. I, th- I thought they got away with it more than a lot of other bands who were who were embracing the technology in the same way because they did have that inherent kind of quirkiness. It's not mm. as pronounced as some of the examples mm. you've given before, but yeah. it does sound of its time when I hear it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that was it's kind of a sad note to end on with yeah. Ricky passing away. Well, it was strange also that none of the band knew about it and even his sister didn't know that he was ill, which is, um, yeah, yeah, unusual situation there, but a very sad ending. 
to this period for the band, but they did bounce back. Do we want to sum up the B-52s? Mm. Can we try to sum them up, what they mean? Why we're talking about them? Yeah. Mm. Well, for them, as you were saying, Mark, to spring fully formed, you think it's so preposterous that it almost defies belief, and that's how extraordinary they were. And I'm not disagreeing with your preposterous theory, (laughs) your theory of preposterousness, but... Yeah, I think for them to spring fully formed with that extraordinary sound and from look and a place style. like yeah. Athens, Georgia, mm. it was a classic thing. We've seen bands spring from nowhere, like XTC from Swindon, you know, from the west of England, and bands who do have that opportunity to kind of grow up themselves separate from the scene, and they do come up with that unique sound. And I think B-52s were like that, and they had several amazing elements, like Fred, what he did, what Cindy and Kate did, the keyboard sound, What Ricky did with his, I mean, your display with the guitar there, that was amazing how Ricky came up with that. Mm, Yeah, like how? Mm, (laughs) It just came around by accident. We don't know. It's hard to find out too Mm. much about them. That's the other thing. They're Mm. shrouded in mystery in a lot of ways. Mm. Well, I think they're quite low key and quite shy. Mm. The big Rolling Stone feature that was done on them in 1980, their manager said to the journalist when he was about to go backstage after the gig, he said, you know, like, they're a bit shy or they're a bit low-key, you know, like, you'll struggle to get any, anything out of them. And he'd just seen this show <laughs> mm-hmm. and, and he said, yeah, my experience was exactly as the manager warned, more or less. Wow. So there was a theatrical element to them that was so well-refined, music that was unique, Mm. and their sound did evolve from album one through to album three with a very long EP. In the midst of it, they maintained their B-52-ish charm, I think, all the way through, although there was a bit of that electronic stuff as well. And, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think they're an extraordinary band and, yeah, completely unique. Mm. Graham, how did they affect you? Well, I've explained how they affected me, you know, when I first saw them. Mm. I just wanted to finish up with a quote from Gerald Casal from Devo. He said, The B-52s and Talking Heads always felt like Devo's kindred spirits. We were all unique and not very punk. And he goes on about the punk orthodoxy. But he said, It was exciting because I knew where they were coming from, how they were grabbing from the 60s kitsch with the beehive hairdos and the, the theatricality of it all. It was like they'd come from their own planet. And then he said, who on earth sings about a rock lobster? And I think that kind of sums it up for me. Mm. Who Mm. on earth sings about a rock lobster? (laughs) I think of all the bands that we've spoken about in the four or five years we've been doing this, I'm going to go out on a limb and say they arrived the most fully formed and unique of any of the bands Mm. with the lineup, the vocal stylings, the look, the subject matter, the sound of any band that I can think of and I would struggle to to reference them to anybody because every band we've talked about you can see the joints and you can mm. see where they came from the B-52s I love the fact that they're shrouded in mystery and I can't figure them out to this day and I kind of love that about them mm. 